Hi, and welcome to Bridgetown Online. My name is Krista, if we haven't met. I want to read a passage from Isaiah 40 before we begin. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So today, let's praise the creator of the universe, one who understands us and never grows tired, the one who is worthy of all of our praises. Let's sing. Yeah, Jesus, we bless your name, we praise your name. Pray that the light, the joy, the peace from the name of God would just fill the room. Would fill our minds, fill our hearts as we worship you today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and gathering with us. At this time, if you're with friends or family, say hi to them. If you're not, don't worry, you're not alone. We're with you. We love you. everybody, for the next part of our gathering, we're going to have a moment for generosity. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bethany. I want you to know that 10% of every dollar you give goes to those who are vulnerable or in need in our city and around the world. So we want to invite you to give even now. You can do that at bridgetown.church or through our PushPay app. Hey Bridgetown, it is my joy to introduce you to my dear friend Tyler Staten, who is a guest teacher for today. Tyler is the lead pastor of Trinity Grace Church in Brooklyn, New York. He is a dear friend of mine. We're in a little circle of brothers that kind of spend a week together every single spring and just kind of help each other pastor well. He's a man that I love and I respect. And we had him on the teaching schedule months and months and months ago to come out in our summer teaching series and to teach teach and to deposit into our staff. And then COVID hit. And we decided, you know what? He's from Brooklyn. He's been on lockdown in Manhattan. Why don't you, or not Manhattan, but in New York, why don't you just come out anyway with your family, get out of town, and let's spend a little time together as families. We had a great kind of couple of days together, went over to the beach and spent time in the Pacific Northwest. And he was with our staff and our elders. And it was just really a gift of his deposit. This is a a leader that I really love and respect, as well as a good friend and partner in the work of the kingdom of God. So please welcome Tyler Staten to continue our series through the Gospel of Matthew. Hey, Bridgetown. So good to be with you. If you would, turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to catch up with you there in just a second. I want to start with this. I have a vivid memory of standing in front of my apartment door, keys in my hand, with no intention of actually opening the door. And I was startled then when my wife suddenly threw it open and said, Tyler, what are you doing? I was so lost in prayer. It was one of those moments when the actual world faded into a blurry background. And this one phrase I was holding before God was in focus and only that. Why couldn't I drive it out? I didn't ask it in those exact words, but that was the general sentiment. A few minutes before, I had discovered an 18-year-old kid exchanging needles with a group of older homeless men on a park bench. 
Andres was a kid in my youth ministry that I led at that time. I had personally discipled him. I'd spent plenty of early mornings with him before school. I'd talked to him about girls and grades and weekend plans and Jesus on those very park benches. And then one day, a couple of years prior to this, he was just gone. He was arrested and taken to juvie, but I could never get accurate information about which facility he was at. I knew it was a couple hours outside of the city, but not even in what direction. And then on this one cold, gray February day, somewhere around 24 months since I had last seen him, I'm walking through the park, and there he is, staring at an old shattered cell phone screen, living homeless. Dre, Dre, is that you? We end up uh, having a slice of pizza at this shop around the corner, and I invite him back to my apartment. I offer my couch for him to sleep on, a place for him to shower. I'm, I'm even trying to give him a spare key, but he doesn't want any of it. He's happy to see me, but he's not at all interested in my help. And so there I am standing in front of my apartment door, holding my keys in my hand, but frozen, time completely standing still as I'm muttering this prayer under my breath, why, God? I mean, he's just a kid. How could you watch this happen? Are you even there, God? Because you've got a lot of explaining to do on this one if you are. Why couldn't I help him? I tried everything I knew. Why couldn't I drive it out? Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we? drive it out. He then replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Why couldn't I drive it out? Maybe you know what it's like to ask that question. It's not primarily a philosophical or a theological question. It's a personal one. And if we're going to understand this strange story in Matthew chapter 17, then we're going to have to cut through all the distance between us and them because they weren't in a signs and wonders workshop with some questions for the instructor about healing and deliverance. They were looking at a boy, just a kid, suffering. How could a loving God watch this happen? We're laying hands on him. We're asking all the right questions. We're praying all the right words, but none of it's working. How could God stand by and watch this happen? Or as they phrased it, why couldn't we drive it out? Now, there's a few key players in this story. There's the boy who has seizures. Some translations get more specific and diagnose it as epilepsy. There's the father who's desperate to see his son's uh, disease relieved. And then, of course, there's Jesus. But the story is about the disciples. Matthew, as an author, includes only two miraculous healing stories after Jesus' Galilean ministry. He's essentially broken his gospel up into three major parts. There's part one, which is the miraculous conception. That's Mary and Joseph and the manger and all that stuff. Then there's part two, the Galilean ministry. This is the core of Jesus' teaching, which is often accompanied by signs and wonders. And then finally, there's part three, when Jesus begins preparing for the end. This is when he suddenly stops talking about a kingdom and starts talking very quickly cryptically about his death. Uh, It's when he begins preparing his disciples to carry on the kingdom when he is no longer present with them in body. And right there in the middle of part three, there's another story of miraculous healing. Now, Matthew's editor would have had him move this story back into part two with all of the others. It's creative writing 101. This is a great story, Matthew, but it's out of place unless... The story is not about the healing. 
And there are clues. I mean, we get almost nothing about the crowd's reaction, the father's response. We don't even know about the boy's condition after he was healed. We get your disciples couldn't cast it out. Jesus can. And then the next scene cuts to him alone with his disciples, breaking down the tape and explaining the mechanics. The story, almost like dislike any of the other miracle stories isn't something that we read to learn about Jesus' identity or his power, but it's a story we read to learn something about discipleship, about what it means to follow Jesus and to share in his mission. Why couldn't we drive it out? And the answer is hidden in such a minor detail that most will overlook. So look really closely at your Bible and you'll notice something interesting. There is no Matthew 17, verse 21. It skips right from verse 20 and then immediately to verse 22. And that's not a typo or a printer mishap. It's because some of the recovered manuscripts of Matthew's gospel include verse 21 and some don't. And so the publishers of most modern scholarly translations add it as a footnote. For instance, I'm reading from the NIV, and if you're reading from the NIV, you just cut to the bottom and you can see verse 21 there added as a footnote in fine print. But Mark's gospel, which was written before Matthew's, includes verse 21 in the actual copy. So whether you think this was in Matthew's original manuscript or not, we can be sure that it was a part of the story and something that Jesus actually said, because Mark 9, 29 and Matthew 17, 21 read this. This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Martin Lloyd-Jones called that the key verse for unlocking revival across the Western world. And so I want to talk to you today about the way of the mustard seed, prayer and fasting. What is it about the combination of something as weak and feeble as mumbling to God about my worries and skipping a meal or two? How could this really be the key that unlocks supernatural power? Well, let's begin with prayer. Uh, I was walking to the gate in, or to my gate in the airport to fly here, and on the way, my wife said to me, I feel like we've forgotten something. And then she paused for a minute and went, Kevin! Which, of course, is a reference to Home Alone. Now, she actually did think we had forgotten something, but when she said that line in that environment, this whole plot came into her imagination. And when she said that very common name in that tone, in that environment, that whole plot rushed into my imagination. And even if you have never met her in your life, when I said that, it came into your imagination. Isn't that fascinating? that just the saying of a name, given the context, can bring a whole story to your mind. Jesus is doing the exact same thing here. When they came to the crowd, now if you heard John Mark's teaching from last week, you know who they are and where they are coming from. They are coming down a mountain from an encounter with the manifest presence of God, and they discover that the others who waited for them at the bottom have gotten caught up in a spiritual scuffle that they don't know their way out of. This is the reenactment of a famous scene. Moses came down from a mountain from meeting with God, carrying two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments chiseled on them. And there he discovers Israel at the bottom, has built an altar, and is worshiping a golden calf in his absence. They have gotten themselves into a spiritual scuffle that they don't know the way out of. That's Exodus 32. Now, Exodus is the story that the Hebrew children would have been steeped in since preschool. It's a famous movie scene that, or I mean, I'm sorry, a famous movie scene barely scratches the surface of the familiarity that every Israelite would have immediately had when they put the pieces of the scene together. Matthew hammers this home for his readers by pointing out that on that mountain, Jesus and his core three were meeting with God, Elijah, and... Moses. So he made sure that for every reader, all the bells would be ringing. Matthew sets the scene, and that's enough said. This is the frame that this story has to be interpreted within. So Jesus comes off a mountain, reenacting Moses' famous scene to say something about prayer. Now, what does Moses have to do with it? Well, Moses knew God in prayer like no one else did. Exodus 33 says that he spoke to God like a friend. 
And yet in the very same chapter, Moses asked to see God's face, to come unrestricted, unveiled into his presence, and the request is denied. You cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live, Exodus 33, 20. No one can see the face of God and live to tell the tale. That's the story that Moses told them. Jesus reenacts the same scene to deliver an update to the message. I'm making a way for you to experience even what Moses was denied, a way for you to stand unrestricted in God's presence, and it's called prayer. Thomas Kelly, in his little book, A Testament of Devotion, has this fascinating insight. He says that in the Old Testament, no one could stand before God and live. And then after resurrection, the same thing is true. Only it's the outer man, the false self that dies. The false self in the presence of God falls to its knees and cannot live. I love the story Brennan Manning tells about his 20-day silent retreat to a cabin in Colorado. Nothing to distract himself with, nothing to look forward to, just alone and present before God for 20 days. Sounds terrifying. But he and God were pretty familiar with each other. I mean, they'd been through a lot together. Manning was an alcoholic with a story so wild that it was a miracle he was still alive, and he journeyed his way out of the grip of addiction through prayer. But that was a long time ago. At this point, he's 18 years into a newfound calling as a Franciscan priest. He's a sought-after speaker and a renowned author. And he, an accomplished professional Christian, alone and undistracted before God, confesses that he can't help but notice this wide gap between all of his intellectual theory and his actual lived experience. These are the words from his own journal on that retreat. The great divorce between my head and my heart had endured throughout my ministry. For 18 years, I proclaimed the good news of God's passionate, unconditional love, utterly convicted in my head, but not feeling it in my heart. I never felt loved. He carried a false view of himself, first into alcoholism and secondly into religion. He had played both the younger and the older brother in the prodigal son story. And now finally, alone on a mountain with no one to become and no one to impress, God was inviting him to shed the false self and let himself be loved. Brennan Manning always believed in the love of God. He studied it, illustrated it, wrote about it, spoke about it, counseled people toward it, but then stripped of all of his distraction, all of his activity, all of his busyness and his doing with nothing to dress himself up with. That's where he knew the love of God. In the place of prayer, belief becomes knowledge. In English, we typically understand belief to be deeper and more personal than knowledge. Knowledge is purely intellectual. Belief is gut-level conviction. Knowledge is the language of the head. Belief is the language of the heart. But that's not the Hebrew understanding. The Hebrew word for knowledge is yada, and it refers to a relational knowing. It's even used as a euphemism for sex. That's why people refer to knowing someone in the biblical sense. And in the Hebrew understanding, until you had personal, relational, experiential evidence, all you had was theory, and that's belief. So most people believe that it's a bad idea to touch a hot stove. Some people know it's a bad idea to touch a hot stove because they've actually set their hand down on the red burner and probably still have rings on their palm to prove it. They have experiential knowledge of what most of us just believe. Let me bring that a little bit closer. If, if you were to ask me, Tyler, how do you know your wife loves you? I'd begin to explain to you all the ways that our relationship works, all the times that she's chosen my company freely, all the times that she stuck with me when I was lost or wrong or difficult, all the occasions she's been a rock of support, all the fun evenings we've had of laughter, all the meals we've shared, all the times we've enjoyed of, of just complete nothingness together. Now, what is all of that? It's relational knowledge. I've experienced her love. That's how I know. So many of us are disenchanted or disillusioned when it comes to our experience in the Christian life. We love the ideas. I mean, grace, hope, power, great on paper. But when they come off the page and into my flesh and bones, 
the weight of my guilt still feels stronger than my understanding of grace. Or circumstances outside of my control still so easily crush my hope. And the power through prayer sounds amazing, but then there was that one time when I gritted my teeth and actually believed with the mustard seed of faith, and then he still died. Or she still just became callous towards God, or I still ran into Andres on a park bench living homeless. We've all got our own versions of that story. So many of us are all in on the theory, but we don't live like it's true here, now, today, because our experience in the Christian life is hollow when it's held up against the promises of Jesus. It was Marshall McLuhan who said, everyone I know who ceases to believe begins by ceasing to pray. And in my pastoral experience, that's true. Because without prayer, belief becomes agonizing. I mean, prayer is meant to be the hydration of the spiritual life. Run the race, but to run the race of faith without prayer is like trying to run a marathon without water. It is agony. Spiritual knowledge has to be inhabited. Belief is buying into a theory. Knowing is to personally, vulnerably trust the theory that you already believe in. I love these words from Frederick Buechner. For what we need to know, of course, is not just that God exists, not just that beyond the steely brightness of the stars, there is a cosmic intelligence of some kind that keeps the whole show going, but that there is a God right here in the thick of our day-to-day -day lives, who may not be writing messages about himself in the stars, but in one way or another is trying to get messages through our blindness as we move around down here, knee-deep in the fragrant muck and misery and marvel of the world. It is not objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience of God's presence. That is the miracle we are really after. And that is also, I think, the miracle we really get. It's not enough to believe in the love of God. We have to allow God to love us exactly as we are, naked and unashamed, to borrow a phrase. And the way that we allow that love in is prayer. As we pray, the blinding light of God's love seeps into every crack in our inner world, and the Spirit opens our eyes to discover ourselves as we really are, fixed in the firm gaze of God. That's the invitation of prayer. I believe in the love of the Father. Prayer is the experience of that love. I believe in the friendship of the Son. Prayer is the experience of that friendship. I believe in the supernatural power of the Spirit. Prayer is the experience of that power. And the yada, the relational, experiential kind of knowledge, it doesn't always happen in the moment of prayer. In fact, most of the time, the prayer feels quite normal, but it then infuses our otherwise ordinary lives with the miracle of God's presence. I'll let Manning say it himself. What if the hour you spend in the prayer room is when you refocus on Jesus so you can carry his presence with you into the other 23 hours of the day, with a heightened awareness that he is with you, that he is for you, that he likes you, that he hears your thoughts? You start to pray in real time. You instinctively lift situations to the Lord in the actual moment you experience them, while you are watching that distressing news report or hearing about your friend's latest crisis. You're no longer deferring all your prayers to some later, holier moment because your whole life is becoming that holier moment. Prayer is not a business meeting where you let God in on the items of your agenda and then sort out an adequate timeline. It is the space you make so that the blinding light of his unbreakable love can shine into every crack until the fragile false self is shattered. No one can glimpse the face of God and live. That's what Moses told them. Jesus updates the offer. Come freely into God's presence. But all those false forms of worth that you dress yourself up with out there in the world— all the ways you present yourself, all the fragile crutches that you prop yourself up with, all the ways that you trick him or her or them or maybe even yourself into a value of your own making, they fall apart in God's presence. God wants to break you. Why? Because he wants to see you face to face. Intimacy. See, there's this pattern in church history. Every great move of God can be traced back to a few humble people with their heads bowed. 
Prayer movements always precede revival movements, and that's because in the place of prayer, God heals us of our insecurity, our broken thought patterns, our hidden sin, our stubborn cynicism. In the intimacy of prayer, God peels away the imprisonment of our false self and reveals our belovedness. And it's only when we come to terms with our own belovedness that we can behold the belovedness in others and draw it to the surface. That's why revival always starts with prayer. It all comes down to love, to really knowing the things you've spent so much time merely believing. Why couldn't we cast it out? Well, the smallest seed of faith, fertilized with prayer, grows and blooms out of the inner life in supernatural power in this chaotic world. What you were dealing with back there, you need prayer for that. But Jesus didn't stop at prayer. He says prayer and fasting. Fasting. What good is that going to do? We're trying to do an exorcism here, not start a monastery. Well, fasting is actually about spiritual authority. Until now, I've been able to avoid the stickiest part of the passage, verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Come on, Jesus. I mean, that's a bit much. I know you're probably hangry from the hike, but relax. Again, we have to remember the frame that this story is in. Moses coming down the mountain in Exodus. Jesus is not being original here. He's quoting Moses' critique of the Israelites in Deuteronomy 32. So to a crowd that would have known the Torah like the back of their hand, Jesus quotes the Torah, dragging the ancient Exodus story into the current moment. Most people know the broad strokes of the Exodus story. God miraculously frees Israel from Egyptian slavery, and then through a series of miracles, gets them through the desert to the promised land. But N.T. Wright says this, There are two journeys of liberation in Exodus, the journey out of Egypt and the journey to get Egypt out of them, the journey out of slavery and the journey to get slavery out of themselves. And the second liberation journey, that's a road paved by fasting. Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. And the English little faith is the Greek oligopistia, and you won't find it anywhere else in the Bible. It's an interesting word because it doesn't refer to a total lack of faith. It refers to a person whose beliefs aren't expressed in a way that distinguishes them from the common life of the unbeliever. So it's a passive kind of faith that means a different worldview, but a common life. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So the mustard seed analogy is one of Jesus' favorites. This quote is infamous, but, and I hate to out him like this, it wasn't original to Jesus. This was a hyperbole that was common within the rabbinic tradition. It's found in the Sanhedrin before it's found in the Gospels. Paul, who trained as a Pharisee, uses the exact same metaphor in 1 Corinthians. So it's not meant to be literal. It was a figure of speech. These aren't instructions Jesus is giving for re-landscaping the earth if you just believe hard enough. It was a common way to say the smallest seed of faith accomplishes the impossible. When your faith is expressed in a way that distinguishes you, that makes you uncommon, there's power. But you're trying to express faith and you have no authority, so there's no power. And I'm not sure what comes to your mind when I say authority, but in the context of Jesus, spiritual authority is just the the ability to make the kingdom of God visible where it's lacking. So think of healing or justice or the most common example, the one that we have the most familiarity with is probably something like preaching. Some people preach technically great sermons. Other people preach and there's power. Suddenly the kingdom of God becomes visible where it was lacking just a few minutes ago. There's spiritual fruit produced in an obvious and clear way. That's authority. The kingdom becomes visible where a minute ago it was invisible. Why couldn't we drive it out? Because your beliefs aren't distinguishing you from anybody else. You're trying to exercise authority, but you've neglected the means to grow in that authority. Fasting. 
A few years ago, I heard the penetrating whisper of the Spirit say to me, if you want to minister to the people of Brooklyn, you have to overcome the idols of Brooklyn. And that was the culminating moment of a theme that God had been putting his finger on, on in my life for a while, and it unraveled me. I mean, I wept the way you do when you know it's God and you know it's for you, and no matter what the cost, the answer is yes. So I made a list of the idols of the land in New York City, and that list included the categories of indulgence, materialism, appearance. Indulgence, I gave up alcohol. Materialism, I, I went a period of time not buying myself anything apart from food. And appearance, I stopped cutting my hair altogether. Why? Because I thought that if I did all of that, maybe God would do what I want him to do a bit more. No. Because I thought if I did all that, God would listen to me more, notice me more, maybe even like me a touch more. No, none of that. Fasting has absolutely nothing to do with legalism and absolutely everything to do with authority. Because I was an accidental conformist. I was trying to lead a church in New York, but my life was shaped probably more, but at least as much by the city as it was by the way of Jesus. Because I had little faith, distinguished beliefs, and a common life. Fasting is not about legalism, it's about growing in authority. And I lived that fast for 320 days, and here's what I discovered. Fasting starts with renunciation, but it ends in joy. See, there's something that we see in children that we are never supposed to lose, joy unaided by consumption. When you're a kid, all you need is uninterrupted time and space. If you just give a kid a patch of grass and a little bit of time, step back and watch them be dazzled with wonder at everything they'll discover. And I began to realize that that feeling that I had when I was a kid with just open space and time, I could now only access through a burger, a beer, and maybe a movie afterward. Because over time, we tend to trade in joy unaided by consumption for escape, always aided by consumption. And that almost works. Almost. Song of Songs chapter 1 says, For your love is more delightful than wine. I like wine. I worked as a server at a wine bar in the East Village in Manhattan for a little while. And so in a blind taste test, I think I could pick out the difference between the Charles Shaw Merlot from Trader Joe's and something fancy. Like if you gave me a taste test between a $3 bottle and a $30 bottle, I think I could pick out the difference. But if you gave me a taste test between a $30 bottle and a $300 bottle, I'm not so sure I could tell you the expensive one. And that's not because there isn't a difference. There certainly is. It's because I haven't trained my palate, so I can't appreciate it. God's love is like the finest wine. It's complex and robust and smooth and intoxicating. And because God's love is like the finest wine, it goes unappreciated on most palates. Sommeliers train for years to savor the tasting notes in a single sip of wine. It's... I'm getting pomegranate. Is that pomegranate? And something acidic. It's tomato. No, no sun-dried tomato with a hint of black pepper. And I'm thinking, really? I was getting wine, above average red wine. Life is not about gaining the palate of a sommelier. You had it at first. It's just about keeping it. But we spend our lives making tiny little exchanges, none of them a big deal all on their own, but they add up. Shopping to cure my boredom, alcohol to trigger rest from responsibility, entertainment and distraction for my every idle moment. These simple pleasures, good things, what the Bible calls appetites of the flesh, dull our taste buds until all we crave is the cheap stuff. Joy unaided by consumption is traded in for escape always aided by consumption. Unless you change and become like little children, ordinary joy. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That was Jesus. Let's take it out of biblical language and put it in the language of psychology for a moment. Uh, Dr. Vincent Felitti says this, it's hard to give up something that almost works. 
Now he's a doctor talking about the power of addiction, but the ripples of truth go so much further than that. He's saying the almost things, they just dull our palate. It's hard to give up something that almost works. An escape aided by consumption almost works, but it doesn't work. And we know that it doesn't. And I was finally admitting that it doesn't. So here's the pathway back to true ordinary joy, fasting. Fasting is the risk of surrendering the almost things you can control to receive the promised things you can't control. And the promised things are infinitely better, but they can only be received and they can never be controlled. Such a compelling invitation, but it's a terrifying journey to get there because the joy of fasting always feels like starving at first. That's why fasting may end in joy, but it always has to begin with renunciation. That's the word that the ancients used for this self-inflicted kind of starving of an appetite that isn't delivering. Medieval philosophy has a dictum that says, Every choice is a renunciation. In other words, for every yes, there is an implied no. A yes to sleeping in is a no to watching the sunrise. A yes to a cup of coffee comes with an implied no to a cup of tea. But Ronald Rollheiser updated that idea, and he says, no, no, every choice is a thousand renunciations. The decision to commit to one romantic relationship is the decision to say no to a thousand other romantic possibilities. The decision to commit to one career path is a no to a thousand other hypothetical career paths. And the decision to say yes to having kids is a saying no to essentially the remainder of your life from that point. He, he concludes this, we want to be a saint, but we also want to feel every sensation experienced by sinners. We want to be innocent and pure, but we also want to be experienced and taste all of life. We want to serve the poor and have a simple lifestyle, but we also want all the comforts of the rich. We want to have the depth afforded by solitude, but we also don't want to miss out on anything. We want to pray, but we also want to watch television, read, talk to friends, and go out. Much of the modern Christian life is an attempt to reconstruct Christianity without renunciation, and the unexpected casualty of that is spiritual authority. So a month or two into those 320 days of fasting from the idols of Brooklyn, I was no longer losing something for spiritual reasons. I was gaining something that I wasn't willing to go on living without. And once you experience this, even just a little bit, you start to notice that it's a theme peppered all over the scripture. It was hidden right there in plain sight the entire time. It's what David calls being without want in Psalm 23. And in Psalm 4, David prays something similar, fill my heart with joy when their grain and wine abound. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of that. He writes, why is everyone hungry for more? More, more, they say, more, more. I have God's more than enough. More joy in one ordinary day than they get in all their shopping sprees. First Timothy chapter six, my personal favorite says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. See, you become dangerous. You become a threat to the principalities and powers of this world when you are so detached from the appetites of this world that you carry authority to bring the kingdom of God where it lacks. So what are those almost things that have this city by both hands, that have your friends, that have your industry? What are the almost things that your world tries to make into ultimate things? And are you free from the hold of those things? If you want to minister to the people of Portland, you have to free yourself from the idols of Portland. What if the spectacle of supernatural power is tied to the hiddenness of fasting? Of course God would do it that way, right? The God who gives his kingdom into the hands of little children, the only kingdom that lasts, the one that will live past all the others, entrusted to the humble. Thomas Kelly once again says, self-renunciation means God possession, the being possessed by God. Out of utter humility and self-forgetfulness comes the thunder of the prophets. How do I go after authority? You starve your almost things, your cheaper substitutes, 
all the means of escape that you used to cope that don't produce true joy. The only way is to feel like you're starving until you learn to live without what almost works. Fasting is the refining of your spiritual palate, and the overflow of that is supernatural power. Why couldn't we drive it out? There's that question again, the one that we started with. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. So I'll close with this picture. In Gene Edwards' brilliant little book, A Tale of Three Kings, he opens with an allegory of the angel Gabriel offering two destinies to one person. The first is to be clothed by the armor of divine power, but that power will also reveal the true inner condition of anyone who wears it. The second destiny is just a tiny seed of divine love that will be planted deep within and yet over time seasoned by pain and sorrow and the shifting circumstances of life in an uncertain world, it will grow and grow until it fills the inner person and then blossoms outwardly in supernatural power. He goes from there to tell the stories of King Saul and King David, Saul who wore power, but of course that power was just a thin veneer over his insecurity and fragility that was eventually exposed in his downfall. It was just armor to protect his fragile false self. And then David, who turned down Saul's armor when offered it and had a really rough go of it in the early days, but eventually became the most revered leader in Israel's history and the line of the Messiah. Prayer and fasting. Those are the humble, hidden ways that we choose the seed of divine love over the suit of armor. And in the upside-down kingdom of God, divine love grows until it blossoms in a force of divine power. I'll give the last words to N.T. Wright. God and Jesus don't do what they do by blasting through all the opposition. They do it by working with the grain of the cosmos by planting seeds that grow secretly, by calling human beings to be co-creators. Let me pray for you. I know that everyone will be watching this on some little screen within their home, but if there's anything that has been said that's resonated with you that you felt like, oh, that hit me, right in the chest in the best way. It hit me like an invitation. Then you just open up your hands. And I wanna pray that that would be a seed that would be planted, that would grow and would flourish. And so, Heavenly Father, I wanna pray that Bridgetown Church would be a people of prayer and fasting that they would know the joy and ease of spiritual authority because they would live detached from the appetites of the world around them. And that they would know the freedom and hope and life of divine love because the, the false self would be shattered again and again and again as many times as it takes so that they could be fully alive naked and unashamed in the presence of God and of one another. And so, Lord, for anyone who you're speaking to, I want to pray that the fruit of today's talk wouldn't happen in this moment, but would come in all the ordinary moments after this one. That people would find themselves praying and that, like Manning describes, it would feel quite ordinary in the moment, but it would become expressed in that their whole lives become a holy moment. And I wanna pray, God, that, that this church would become detached from the idols of this city so that they could speak a better word and tell a better story right in the midst of the one being told all around them all the time. And so we just ask Holy Spirit for blessing that you would bless the people of this community, that you would work in their lives and pull them along by the hand in the same way that Jesus did to his disciples. 
and that you would teach us what it means to be entrusted with your kingdom and to allow you to bring it to life from within us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, we take a moment, we bow our lives before you. At your feet, we take all that we are, all our thoughts, all our ambition, everything we think we've made ourselves to be, and we put it at your feet this morning. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for gathering with us online. We love all of you. Thank you to Tyler for that beautiful teaching on prayer and fasting. Two things on that. One, if you're new to our church, we have an entire practice on fasting that's three weeks long. It's available at practicingtheway.org slash fasting if you want to explore more of kind of Tyler's vision. And two, just a reminder that every single Tuesday we set aside in our rule of life as a church for prayer and fasting. We invite you to skip breakfast and lunch and fast through the day and either break your fast with your community as the Lord's Supper meal that night or however your evening routine is. And we pray at 7 a.m. and at noon right now on Instagram Live. Even if you don't have Instagram, which is great by the way, we invite you to just join us for prayer and for fasting on Tuesdays. Also, make sure you follow the weekly update video because we're hard at work right now to open up our building a little bit and in theory start running morning prayer gatherings of 20 five people to just come together and kind of seed the ground as we move forward to the fall and hope to open our new building up soon. We just want to immerse this building and ourselves in prayer as we head into whatever God has for us next. We love you so much.